Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. All right. Awesome. Well, howdy. It's good to see you guys. Uh, if you have a Bible, we're in 1 John chapter 4. Uh, and if you don't, there's people that would love to hand you a Bible if you'd like one, uh, or you can just listen because I'm going to read to you uh, 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 7. Uh, we'll pray and then jump into it uh, together. So 1 John uh, chapter 4, beginning in verse 7, says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one's ever seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. Let me pray for us. Father, help us now, I pray, understand what it is to be loved by you and what it is to love others with the inexhaustible love of God. Lord, this is one of those things that can just be uh, words that, that don't necessarily impact how we live. And I'm just praying you rescue us from just kind of hanging out here listening to a guy talk. I, I pray, God, you would transport us to a place of really understanding the depths of what we're talking about, intimacy with the Almighty. And God, I pray it would affect how we speak to one another in our homes, how we treat our coworkers, how we navigate this holiday season. Affect us as a result of this time in your word. And I can't generate that. So we're asking you, God, to do something I can't to, to change us. And I want to invite you guys, if you're willing, to pray that and ask him. Say, Lord, please teach me something right now. And then if you would, please pray for me, that the Lord would speak through me and I'd be helpful to you. Well, Father, we love you and we trust you. Use this time and we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Well, when I was a youth pastor here, we used to take our students rappelling and uh, it was a fun adventure. Take the kids outdoors. We would drive off to some place where there was a cliff and then spend the afternoon sending children off the side of a mountain. And uh, we would always go with an outfitter that kind of had all the gear and had all the guides. And so every time we would go with them, he would always sit us all down and give us the speech. And the speech would always start with the gear. Uh, this rope can hold up a Volkswagen Buick. Uh, it will never fray, snap, or break in the slightest. It will hold up children. No one will be lost today because of this rope. Do you believe this? And all our kids would be like, yes, we know, because they heard the speech before. And then he'd move on to the guides. This guide has been guiding for 10 years. He's lowered thousands of young people off the side of mountains. We've never lost a one. None of you will die today under the steady hand of this man right here. And everyone would be like, we know, we know, because they'd heard it. And yet, when it came time to descend down that mountain, about 50% of our students would freak out. <laughs> and normally it was the guys, which I don't really understand that. Uh, like, I don't know if it's because they just like didn't trust the guides intentionally or if it was because the guide was cute. And so he would always get girls to the edge and be like, just lean back. And they're like, okay. And off they would go. <laughs> I don't know. But inevitably, 
guys would step up. And you know, when you're rappelling, you don't climb down the mountain. You lean back into the rope and descend down. And these young guys would get up there. And as soon as they get up there, they go, wait, wait, no, wait, wait. And you go, what? What is, is, the, is the rope fraying? No. Is it snapping? No. What, it was, is the guy hit his head? Is he unconscious? Has he suddenly lost his ability to help you? No. Well, then what's the problem? And they're, wait, wait. And they'd say, wait, like something's wrong. And they would extend the least fun part of the whole process, right? And it was interesting because you would watch that and you go, what just happened here? 30 minutes ago, this guide will take care of you. This rope will hold you. I know, I know, I know. But when you get to the edge, your actions betray what you really believe. Now, why do I tell you that? Because in this passage, John says, so we have come to know and to believe in the love God has for us. And so that's my simple message today. You are loved. And if you know Jesus Christ, then the most powerful being in existence likes you. He knows your name. And my guess is, when I say that to a lot of you, you say, I know. Like, oh, the message today is Jesus loves me. This I know. Like, I already know. <laughs> and yet, if you read this passage, John begins to tell you characteristics of those who know they're loved by God. He said those who know that God loves them are characterized by a fearlessness. There's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. If I know God loves me, I'm not anxious when I walk into social circles. I'm not characterized by nervousness or frustration when I go into work but I have a freedom. I'm fearless and I'm free. I'm free to love other people. The beloved love is what John will say. That when I walk into a room, I'm not trying to get your attention, get your approval, get you to like me. I already have it. The beloved love, it's the most natural movement. Love embraced from God becomes love accept, uh, extended towards other people. And so it's interesting. I can say to you, hey, did you know God loves you? I imagine most of you in this room would say, yes, you'd get that right on a quiz. But if I said, so is your life characterized by a fearlessness and a freedom to love other people? I bet most of us here wouldn't own that because we know it. But do we believe it? And honestly, just to get real real, like I think if we really believed it, it would affect, I think we'd pray more. We'd want to steal away with a God who loves us like this passage is talking about. I think we'd sing differently. I mean, be honest, because I was watching some of y'all. How many of you, when we were singing earlier, we were singing some big stuff. And some of you was, yes, you, you have no rival. You, you have no equal. Yes, that one forever, always, right? I mean, we're saying some pretty profound things to God in a way that's maybe a little bit bored. And I'm not guilt tripping all of you. Maybe some of you were tired. I don't know what it is. But what I'm saying is, Man, if we really understand who Christ is and what he's done, it's going to change the way we talk, the way we live, and the way that we treat the people he's made, right? So if I can say to you, do you know you're loved by God? Yes, but is your life characterized by a fearlessness and a freedom to love others? No, for many of us, it's not. And that's a problem because here's the reality. You're about to be around your relatives a lot, and we got to figure out how to love people sometimes when it's hard. And here's the principle. I can give you a conversation. And when I hear this text preach a lot, it's how to love people. You're supposed to love people. And here's the six things you can do to love people. And you're like, well, that's great. But I don't actually really, really want to. <laughs> and the principle I want to get behind us is this, that it's love embraced that becomes love extended. If you're going to be loving to the people in the world, you have to have a source. You want to be a source? You got to have a source. That's the reality. I had a friend, uh, like years ago when I was in college, go scuba diving in the Caribbean with her family. And she did one of those like crazy unsafe things where you spend like an hour learning how to scuba dive uh, and then you dive into the ocean, you know? Uh, but she did it and uh, went with uh, this big group. And so they pair you up with little swim buddies. And so they paired her up with this middle-aged guy and they, you know, dove into the depths of the ocean together. And each had their own scuba tank on the aspirator. And so her and her little swim buddy are swimming around like pointing at fish together. Everything's great, right? until his oxygen tank fails. Something goes wrong in the tubing, right? And so they had been given a protocol of different hand gestures to alert somebody, having problems breathing. They go get the guide and they help you gently ascend to the top. But when he suddenly got to the point of, I can't breathe, uh, he freaked out. And so he just grabbed her and began shaking her. 
which isn't really solving the breathing problem or communicating to her what's going on, right? And so she's trying to understand, like, this was not in the training session, right? And then he grabs the aspirator out of her mouth, pulls it out, and puts it in his mouth and starts breathing, right? And she realizes, hey, this is a problem, right? What's going on here? And then he starts to try to sort of, like, climb her back up to the surface, which mechanically doesn't really work when you're underwater, but he wasn't making a lot of sense because panic had come into his mind. And so what she realized was, this guy's drowning me. So she does what you can only do at that second, just start hitting the guy, right? And so she's hitting the guy, he's pushing her, and then finally he just grabs her and he just swims as fast as he can to the surface, which gives both of them, you know, that decompression sickness, their eyes get all bloodshot, they were sick for days. It's great, but they survived. Uh, never again to be swim buddies, <laughs> or any kind of buddy, for that matter. But you look at that and you go, what happened? As long as they had a source of life, they could be a source of life to each other, right? Mm, look at that fish, right? And just kind of enjoying each other, right? But as soon as my source of life got turned off, scarcity produces desperation. And desperation, exploitation. And so when I come into a relationship with you, I don't come free to give, I come to take. And many of us, if we're honest, when we enter into social circles or enter into the world, we enter in as takers, not givers. Drains, not fountains. Why? Because we want acceptance. We want approval. We want to feel desired. We want to feel important. We want to feel loved. And so I don't know what flavor it takes for you, but for some of us, it's the amount of people that when I put something out online, I need to get this certain amount of likes to feel like I'm really valued as a person. Or for others of you, I need to have a certain amount of success so that when I'm at dinner parties, I'm just like, well, I did this and sold that and I did this, harumph, 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 right? And it goes on and people go, wow, this guy seems like he's really got to put together, Bob. And you go, yes, I sure do. And you leave that party feeling good. I like those people. Why? Because they made me like me. Or we find different ways to do it. I did it to myself the other day in an area that I'm never in, cooking. Uh, I was in charge of frying the turkey uh, at Thanksgiving. And so I didn't do any preparations beforehand. Donna did it all. But I showed up that day and I got there and suddenly I realized I'm super nervous about how this turkey is going to turn out. And we had all these guests coming over, visitors from our church, all these different people that we we're so excited about loving, being a ministry to them. But when I showed up in the kitchen, Donna was like, here's your 18 pound turkey. And I don't know if you've ever fried a turkey, but 18 pounds, that's a, that's a huge mistake. They make YouTube videos out of guys that do that and end up lighting their house on fire uh, because grease comes pouring out, gets lit up, and uh, you're a movie, congratulations. So um, she shows me this big turkey and I start freaking out. I'm like, oh my God, this is not gonna work. I'm gonna fail at frying it. I'm gonna fail in my front yard, frying a turkey, lighting it on fire, and everyone's gonna come over and go, why is Ben such an idiot? And be like, I don't know, right? And then while I'm in the middle of panic about that, my neighbor comes running across the street and was like, hey man, you frying a turkey? Hey, can I throw one after you? And then he runs back and gets his mother-in-law and's like, hey, this guy's a turkey frying expert. Gets on the phone, hey, this is so great, I got a turkey frying expert right here. And I'm just like, and, and the crazy thing was, Donna and I had been praying, Lord, we wanna meet our neighbors, we wanna be a light to our neighbors. <laughs> Halloween, we, we went out, sat in our front yard, like, hey, let's meet all the neighbors. Didn't see a single neighbor, like total ministry to our neighborhood fail. And yet here, one is coming to my doorstep and I'm trying to push him away. Like I'm short with Donna. Why'd you buy this turkey? And I'm this guy, I'm like, get out of my yard. And I'm just being so impatient. And, and finally I had to stop and I'm like, what's the matter? Like, why do I care so much? Like if the turkey lights on fire, like what's the worst gonna happen? We're, we'll eat ham. And, and I realized I, I had put a sense of significance in this. That, that I would feel important or people would, and I'm like, in a turkey? What happened? But it's so easy to do it, that I've got to pull from you a sense of approval rather than coming in with it. And I wasn't a blessing, at least initially, to a lot of the people I wanted to be. And some of you hear that and you go, wow, you've got problems. But let me tell you something. Patrick Carnes, one of the leading voices on addiction in our country today, when he says, how do people get to a point where they abuse substances? He says, the root of all substance abuse is feeling unloved. Now, when I feel like I'm not loved, at some point, that pain has to be numbed and some kind of good feeling has to come in. And if I can't get it from God or people, I'll settle for a website or a, or a drink or a drug. How addicted is our country? Addicted online, addicted to substances, addicted to pills. Why? Because we're trying to fill something and we're entering the world as drains instead of fountains, looking for a source of life from others rather than being a source of life for others. And so let me tell you something, the lie that launches a million sins and puts a lot of stress into your holiday weekend is the lie that I have to get my approval, my love from others rather than being tapped into the source. 
but the beloved love. Love embraced from God becomes love extended for other people. That's what John is championing here. We need to know and believe that we're loved by God because the beloved love. We get to be lights to our neighborhood. We get to be a blessing to people, even in other political parties, right? (laughs) Because I have a love from God I can extend to others. But let's ask the obvious question. Some of you hear this and you're like, well, Ben, that's fantastic. I want to feel loved by God. Some of you are like, I've been going to Sunday school or whatever or hearing messages my whole life. I want to feel loved by God, but I don't feel it. So you're telling me you got to feel loved by God and you got to feel it so that you can love other people. How am I supposed to feel that? How do I know that I am loved? Let's say that the subjective feelings burn off objective truth. How can I know that I am loved so I can feel loved by God? If being loved by God is going to help me love other people, how do I know? We'll take it out of the religious circle for a minute. How do you know you're loved by anybody? Can't see love. Can't put it in a little bottle. What you got there? A little bit of love for you. Can't do that. So how do you know love exists anywhere? Think about movies. Think about novels. Think about those shows you watch where they want to show you that one character loves another. How do you know? How, what do they show you that convinces you love exists? And some of you might say, well, Ben, love is like the wind. You can't see love, but you feel the effects of it, right? And you'd be right. You're right. So what do you see that proves to you love is there? I would say they show you three things over and over again in life to show you love exists. I think the first thing is they show you love initiates. It initiates. Love will not sit still. When the beloved falls in love with the other, He will move. Love will not stay. You will never see a 20-year-old guy, when it dawns on him, he really loves a girl. Not just think she's cute, but wants to spend the rest of his life with her. When that realization lands on him, you'll never see him go, I love her. Weird. (laughs) And keep doing what he's doing. Because love moves. Love sends text messages. Love sends emails. Love writes songs. Love sings poetry. Love moves towards the beloved. So Princess Buttercup, when she's held captive in Princess Bride, says, I know my Wesley will come for me. How do you know that? Because what they have is two of, right? (laughs) And she knows true love comes running for the beloved, right? How do you know love exists? It sends, it initiates, it moves towards the beloved. It will not sit still. Second way they show you is love sacrifices. Love will give itself for the sake of the beloved. So Jack will freeze to death in the Atlantic to keep Rose up on that door after the Titanic sinks, right? He'll just sit there and eat it till he dies, right? Why? I will willingly give my life for the sake of the one I love, right? Frozen! Anna will step in front of that sword, right? Why? Because she loves her sister. And she knows true love will thaw that frozen heart, right? And so how do you know? Because true love sacrifices for the beloved. Bruno Mars will catch a grenade for you. (laughs) Step in front of a train for you. Why does he say it that way? Why sing that in a love song about grenades rolling in? Like, why say that? Because he knows that we know that when I see sacrifice, I know love is there. And so when I see sacrifice, I know a beloved will surrender his life to the flames for the sake of the loved. And love stays. It stays. Love will stay even when it's hard and even when everyone else runs out. So Noah will keep reading the notebook to Allie even though she has Alzheimer's and doesn't remember who he is. And for the guys who don't know what I'm talking about, Adam Sandler (laughs) will keep romancing Drew Barrymore in 50 First Dates, even though she has some kind of memory problem and forgets him every morning. He'll keep wooing her. Why? Because he loves her. And true love stays even when the staying's hard. That's what we say in our wedding vows, that I promise to love you for better or for worse, in sickness and in health. Why do we say it that way? 
Because we know in our most sacred social environment that we create interpersonally, the way to demonstrate love before God, our beloved in the world, is to tell them, here's how you know I love you. I'll stay even when it's hard. Because we know that's what love does. It sins, it sacrifices, and it stays. And when you see those things, you say, I know love exists. And you say, Ben, why are we talking about this? Because John tells us, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us. John says, in this, there was a thing, something happened, and when it did, it made manifest the love of God. The root of that word manifest is the word light. He says, there was an event that happened, and it turned the lights on, and we saw God loves me. I know God loves me because I saw something that convinced me of it. What did you see, John? He says, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world. God sent because love sins. Man, if you want to really show somebody you love them, you don't send them an email. Maybe you do, like if it's like a niece or something, I don't know. But let's say you want to declare your love to someone you want to marry. You don't send that in an email. You may not even send them a letter. For me, when I wanted Donna to know I loved her and wanted a relationship with her, I didn't send her a text or an email or a letter. I sent her young people with a poem and a guitar to sing to her at her front door, inviting her to dinner with her beloved, right? <laughs> because I loved her. And love moves towards the beloved. And the Bible says, how do you know you're loved by God? In this, his love's manifest. He sent to us. And he sent to us, not a text, not an email, not an angel, not a prophet, not a nice guy. He sent his best the best emissary of heaven, the very son of God came for you because God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but have life. That's what this whole season is about. It's a massive declaration from God. You are loved. Exhibit A is that I came for you that love has sent for you so that we might live through him. He came to be life for us. Christianity is not a group of people who've ascribed to the moral teachings of some kind of religious figure. That's not who we are. Christianity is not some people who have knit together out of a common set of political beliefs. That's not who we are. Christians are people who heard the message and received and believed that God loves us and the way we were convinced of it is because we saw he sent his son that we might live through him. We're not better, we're not smarter, we're not more spiritual. We just embraced the love that came because love sends through his son. Why did he come? Verse 10, and this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. How do you know you're loved? Love sins and love sacrifices. He loves us, and I love it. It tells you two barriers he overcame. The first barrier was that we didn't love him back. God didn't wait for us to love him before Christ came. You weren't even born yet, and Christ came. That his love is coming for us, leaping over the barrier of our indifference. And not only that, he sees the much bigger barrier of our violation of a holy God. That we as humanity have walked away from submission to God. Did that stop Jesus? No, he went running through that barrier and sacrificed for us. It says he's the propitiation for our sins. Now, for those of you who don't use the word propitiation in normal everyday conversation, let me explain what that means. It's... Um, it's a temple imagery word that in the Old Testament, uh, God gave his people this set of rituals they would do and, and they were pictures, they were images of what God wanted to do with all of history. And, and one of the things he gave them was he gave them the 10 commandments, gave them to Moses, the law of God, the holiness of God written on stone. Here's how to love me and how to love each other. And it's interesting, do you remember when Moses got that commandments. He came down off the mountain. They had a big party when Moses read them. And the people said, all that is written, we will do. 
And God's response was, oh, that you had such a heart. He says, you can't, right? You can't. And so in the moment God gave us his holiness written out in words, he gave us a system of sacrifices to show you what was necessary when we violate the holiness of God. None of us are who we should be. And so in the Old Testament, God gave them a picture. And that picture was those commandments would sit in a box. It's called an ark, which is Hebrew for box. And that box had a lid called the hilasterion. And the idea was, as God looks down and sees his law, if you can live in accordance with it, you can have a relationship with God. But no one obeys that law. And so that box was kept in a room called the Holy of Holies. And you weren't invited in, and neither was I. No human being could be. And so the idea was, God dwells in holiness. And when he looks down and sees his violated law, everyone has violated it. So no one's invited into that room except for one day a year when the high priest would sacrifice a lamb and he would step into that room and he would take the blood of an innocent lamb and spread it across the top of that box. And the imagery, and it was just a picture, it was symbolism. The symbol was when God looks down, he no longer sees his violated law. He sees that all of our violations are covered by an innocent one who paid our debt for us. And when he sees that, he can be merciful to us. We get a relationship with him restored. And so that lid was called the hilasterion, the mercy seat. It's the same word we translate propitiation. That what was a symbol in the Old Testament became reality in the new that Jesus Christ came for us and then he demonstrated his love. How? By being the propitiation for us that when he sees our violation of God, he who knew no sin, he had never sinned, became sin for us. That's what the cross was for, that I will take the punishment for you. I will take the debt for you so I can rip open the curtains of the Holy of Holies and introduce you back into the family of God, that Jesus Christ will give all to pay our debt and move it out of the way. How do you know love is present because God sends and God sacrifices. So right out of college, when I moved here to Spring, Texas, I had a roommate that um, it was the most fascinating thing. I mean, he's 22 years old and he would sit in his bedroom and he would have all his receipts laid out on a table and like a Excel spreadsheet and would track all of his finances down to the penny on an Excel spreadsheet which I don't hear the sounds of shock from you that I was anticipating. Uh, let me say again, he wasn't 40. He didn't have kids. He didn't have, I mean, this guy's 22. I didn't know any 22-year-olds that did that. He's got a little visor on, right, and little spectacles and kind of working his little tax machine. I mean, you're like, what are you doing in there, right? Just meticulous calculating. He knew his credit score off the top of his head. I'm like, who knows that in college? But he loved being financially responsible. And he loved this girl that he met, and I got a front row seat to watching them fall in love, watching them begin to see marriage in the future. There was just one problem. She had an enormous mountain of debt from very irresponsible choices in her 20s that involved credit cards. And it's the kind of debt that's not gonna get solved in one lump sum. It's gonna get solved in like a lifetime. And so I watched this guy that, man, his pride and joy was that credit score, baby. And his ability to control his finances and him to realize if I want her, I get this. And this is going to devastate my financial situation. But he looked at the cost and he said, I'll take it. I'll take it because I want her. I cried at their wedding. Right? I don't know if everyone else in there knew it, but I knew what it was going to cost him. But he never held it over her head. He didn't make a speech about it on stage. He just bore it so that it could open up the door for a relationship with them. That's what our Christ has done. That's what Jesus has done. Look at the weight of all that we've done, that all that we, we haven't actualized our potential as human beings. And if you don't believe that, read the news today. We're so far from who we're meant to be. 
And Christ didn't recoil in terror at our ugliness and the sick, sad things you do in the dark. What did he do? He moved towards us. And he says, all the debt, I'll pay it. And whatever requires, I will pay it so that I can open the door for relationship with you and God again. Our best destroyer in the Navy is called the USS Michael Mansour. Why is it called that? Because in 2006, Michael Mansour was a Navy SEAL, was with his team in Ramadi, driving insurgents out of that area. And while in a sniper position, a grenade was lobbed up onto their rooftop. He and two other men from his team had a grenade lobbed in the middle of them, and Michael, without hesitation, threw his body on top of it, absorbed the blast, and by doing so, saved his friends. So we gave him the Medal of Honor for that because our country realizes there's no more than you can give than your own life. Greater love has no man than this that he'd lay down his life for his friends. There's no love greater than that. So our country honors him with the highest honor we have, and the Navy wants to sail out under that name, Michael Monsoor, because what they said at his medal ceremony was death came for Michael's friends, and Michael said, you cannot have them. I will go in their stead. And that's what Christ has done. Into the penalty for our sin, he flung himself. Do you think Michael Mansour's friends ever sit and question whether or not he loved them? I think their mind drifts back to that moment and they realize we have proof that he does. Do you wonder if the heavens care about you at all? I would charge you, look at the cross. Look at what he was willing to give. He didn't have a home Jesus Christ was homeless for us. And then he sacrificed his very blood for us. You can't give more. Are you loved? Love sins and love sacrifices. Look at what he has done and love stays. Verse 13 says, by this we know we abide in him and he in us because he's given us his spirit. You know God loves you because he sent his son. You know his son loves you because he sacrificed his life. And you know the spirit of God loves you because he abides. That word means stays right here. That when you put your faith in Christ, the very spirit of God lands in you and he will never leave us and never forsake us. That's the comfort of God. And you can know your love because when you trust Christ, his spirit stays. So I had a friend in high school and her brother was a, a professional athlete, one of the most attractive men I've ever seen. And he was in love with this girl that, I don't know if she was a model, could have been, should have been, I don't know. They were the most attractive couple I'd ever seen. And it was the kind of attractive that stops conversations when they walk in the room. I don't know if you've encountered people like that. Like you're talking to your buddies, you're like, yes, anyway, I says to <laughs> Because you're like, whoa, what? Like they're just very attractive people. And, and not only are they very attractive people, they were also very humble and nice. And so they were just the easiest people in the world to root for, you know? And as they begin to march towards marriage, you're like, this is like the all-American couple. This is unbelievable. And yet as they got closer to the idea of getting married, they found out she had an MS and started having trouble using her hands. And then fairly quickly after that, she wasn't able to comb her own hair because she couldn't lift her arms. And so the prospect of, of that journey she was on led her to talk to him and say, hey, uh, you didn't sign up for this. There's a long road of struggle in front of us with this and you don't need to take this. And so she told him, you can bow out and, and, and I think you should. But he wouldn't hear a word of it. He said, absolutely not. And so when they got to their wedding day, I remember sitting in that wedding. I cried in that wedding and I don't really cry in weddings, but I, I remember <laughs> she choked up when she was supposed to say in sickness and in health, she had trouble saying it because she knew what those words would cost him. But he just gripped her hand and when it was his turn, he said it loud, I promise to love you in sickness and in health for better and for worse. Right? He says, I know what I'm signing up for and I want you anyway. And that's what God says. Do you think he doesn't know who you are? Do you think Jesus Christ saved you at camp when you were in high school because he got kind of swept up? You know, it had been such a good week and Jesus was like, oh, I'll save him. And then later on, you're like, good Lord, I did not realize you were such a train wreck of a human being. <laughs> you think that's what God's done? 
He let you in here and then was like, we made a huge mistake. I don't know how he got in the back. Like, excuse me, sir, you are not supposed to be here, right? You think that's what he does? He knows what you are. He knows who you are. He knows what he's going to have to deal with the rest of your life, right? He knows that, right? He knows it about all of us. And some of us, if we're honest, we're so disappointed with what we struggle with in life. We are. I remember for me, there were issues in my life that God had brought substantial healing on. And I thought they were, it was so powerful. I'm like, someone should make a movie out of it. Like the incredible grace of God to heal even this part of my life or to heal this tragedy in my story. That's so amazing. And then like five years later to wrestle with the same things, you're like, this is like the lame sequel. No one wants to see this movie. I don't want to be in it. It's horrible, right? But God loves us still, and he loves us still. And he's a deposit, Ephesians says, that Holy Spirit, a deposit in you guaranteeing the things to come, right? He's not going anywhere. How do you know you're loved by God? The Father sent the Son. The uh, Son sacrificed his life, and the Spirit stays with you. He stays. And let me tell you something. The more you dive into these realities and sit in them, the more free you're going to be to love other people. The more you can sit in that, when your relatives come over, you're not going to have to prove your political ideas are right or to show them you really are a success. You don't, you're not going to need to try to extract from them validation for you because you have it. And so you can be freed up to be a blessing, even to the most difficult of people. And I want that for us. I want the experience. The world needs that from us. So I remember when I... Uh, was not that long out of college. I went to a NASCAR race. And it was an interesting cultural experience. Never been to NASCAR before. Uh, never seen that many RVs in one place in my life. Or that many airbrushed T-shirts. It was unbelievable how popular they are in that uh, sector. But uh, I remember we showed up there. And as we were driving there, the girl that had invited me, she had four of us in the car. And she said, yeah, I was given these tickets last minute, like a corporate event fell through. And so they gave us some tickets and we got some extras. And so as we were driving around down there, I said, how many extras do we have? And she said, I don't like it, like a hundred. There's four of us in the car. So the three guys that were in the car were like, yes, we can sell them. We're going to be rich on these NASCAR people, right? And then she was like, what? No, like these were freely given to us. Thus, we should freely give. And we were like, oh man, because as soon as she said that, we knew we'd have to do it. You know, it sounded bible or and whatever. <laughs> uh. So I remember we got there and there was a line from the front gate just on deep into the RV park. Like it, you just can't see the end of it. And everyone in it looked stressed because it seemed that there weren't going to be enough tickets for all these people. So it was kind of a tense moment at NASCAR. But I remember we walked up there and she, Rebecca, walked up to this couple and were like, hey, how many people are in your party? And they had like some kids with them, so they're at four. And so she just pulls out four tickets and hands them to them. And for a while, they did nothing. I mean, they kind of looked at her like she's crazy, like what's the matter with you, you know? And they stayed in line. Until finally, one of the kids, I guess because he's bored, you know, just goes up to the ticket counter to see, like what's going to happen if I hand her this crazy thing? And so he hands it to get to the operator up there. She scans it. Okay, you can go in. And I remember their family looking at them as they passed through the gates into NASCAR. They're like, I made it. I'm really here. I'm, uh, you know, and it's kind of all. And the rest of them were like, oh my God. And I remember it, the, the impact it had on them. Like, you, you really just gave us. Why would you, who would? And it just was so confusing to them. They were emotional about it, right? And I remember for the rest of us, like the next hour, we would just do that to people, you know, because after a while, people started to like, sense like, hey, something's going on over there. But no one came up to us and like, are you giving away free tickets? They would just kind of make their way near us. You know, like, hey, man. How you doing? <laughs> Frying turkeys over here? You know, kind of uh, talking to us. And uh, we would just hand them tickets and they would go in and, and people would laugh. People would cry. And it was the most, it was one of the most amazing human experiences with these people. And I remember when they went in, like that moment was done. We're like, oh, wasn't that fun? Yay, okay. And then we had our tickets. And so we got in. We didn't think about the fact that once you get in, uh, we had a block of seats. So when we turned the corner, it was like all the people we'd let in. And they were like, hey, we're like, hey. So we had this big NASCAR party. <laughs> and honestly, I don't really remember a whole lot about what the cars were up to. But I remember that moment. Why? Why could we be generous like that? Because we'd been freely given. We had tickets. We're getting in. There's no question about it. We're covered. And when we had a source, we could be a source. When we knew we had a ticket in, 
We could freely give tickets away. Even if initially people were skeptical and thought we were weirdos, we could still bless them, right? Same here. The beloved love, right? Because God loves us. It's the most natural thing to do. When you know you're loved by God, you can come into work not seeking validation, but seeking to give consolation to those who are suffering. You can walk into your family circles and not try to extract from them a sense of validation, but give to them compassion. When you know you're loved by a holy God, you have a source of love, you can be a source of love. How do you do it? He will say here at the end, we have seen and testified that the Father sent his Son to be Savior of the world, so we've come to know and to believe the love God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and a God abides in him. That word abide means stay right here. As much as the Spirit of God abides in me, I abide in him. So I took my wife on a date the other day, and some of you say, why? You're already married. You don't have to date her. You already married her. Why take her out somewhere? Why get all dressed up and you just sit on the couch? You're both already there, right? <laughs> why did I do that? Do I know she loves me? Yes. Why take her on a date? Because the flow of life just makes us roommates. And so I take her out on dates. Why? To kindle the love that I know is there. Because love is like a fire. You leave a fire alone, it's going to go down. So how do you can get a fire going again? You do what every guy loves to do anyway. You just, you fit with it. Just mess with it, right? <laughs> you, you position it in such a way that it doesn't become something other than a fire. It becomes a fire that's more alive. How do you abide in the love of God? Let me challenge you. This week, before you step out into your office, before, just park the car and give yourself a minute. Read over 1 John 4. Sit and think about the fact that the maker of the stars knows your name and he likes you. And see if a moment of abiding in his love doesn't change the way you talk to that person whose desk is next to yours. Abide in him as he abides in me. And then we can step out and be a blessing to the world. That's the gift God has given us. We don't have to fight for approval. We already have it. We don't have to fight to be loved. We're loved by the inexhaustible maker of the universe. And when we get that, we can be a blessing. And the world needs that, and we have that in Christ. Let me pray for us. Well, Father, I want to thank you that, God, the message of Jesus is not follow a list of rules in order to be a better person. That's not what you came to do. You came among us because you loved us. And for the glory of God and the good of us, you took on our debt. You didn't saddle us with things to do to make you like us. You took on our addictions, our insecurities, our failures. You bore them on the cross. You took all the sting of condemnation and you took it. You took the hit and you buried our guilt and shame and then you rose victorious and says, whoever believes in me, I've come that you would have life and have it to the full that God so loved the world that he sent his only son that we would live through him. And God, I just believe there's some people today that they just, today's the day they're gonna live. They've existed, but it's time to come alive. And that comes in throwing open empty hands and saying, I need Jesus to forgive me, to bring me into the family of God and to love me so I can be a fountain to the world and not a drain. I can be a source of love instead of a siphon of it. And some of you, even this morning, need to cry that out and say, God, I want you. Forgive me. Rescue me. Adopt me. Tell him right now that this is your day. And then God, for many of us, yeah, we know you. We've put our faith in Jesus, but we live often as if we have no source and God, I pray before we get all locked up in the stresses and strains of life, we would pause to remember what it is we were singing about today. That we have a sovereign God over us who even takes what's evil and makes it into our good. That we have a Jesus Christ who has no rival, no equal. That he's a champion over the grave. The beautiful savior 
loves us, knows us. So God, I pray that as we live, we could live like people who really believe that, people who really know that, people who celebrate a God like that. Lord, minister to our hearts with the love that's there for us in Christ. And God, may we be a blessing to the world because we freely give what we freely received. And we pray that in the name of Jesus. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hello and welcome to Postscript. My name is Adam McIntyre and I am joined today by Ben Stewart who just preached a sermon called This is Love. Ben, thank you so much for being here with us sure. today. Thanks, man. So let's jump in. The most important question first. How did your turkey turn out? Turned out great. Uh, mildly overdid one of them. Okay. But had two. It turned out great. Okay. And uh, the neighbor's turkey, I think, turned out the best of them all. Nice. And made a friend. So it was Good. actually pretty cool, man. So two for three on the turkeys. That's not bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the first one wasn't a total loss, sure. but you know... Lord willing, we'll never do that again. <laughs> uh, so uh, to a more serious kind of question, um, we talked a lot, you talked a lot in the sermon about um, how God is love and he is our source of love and, yep. and he is the reason why we are able to love. Mm -hmm. um, so someone had a question about, um, is it possible for us to love God, but not to, to trust him? Uh, maybe it's like still have doubts um, mm -hmm. and things like that. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean... Um, those things are very linked. Sure. You know, if you think about coming into a relationship with God is based on faith right. that Jesus' death truly accomplished something. Sure. So at that level, trust, faith it is the foundation piece of that love relationship. So in that level, it has to be there. That's right. And so uh, that's critical. So okay. yes, in that sense, you have to trust him. But let's say you've put your faith in Christ. You've been born again, you're a child of God by the grace of God through Jesus. Can you struggle to trust God with, will he take care of me? Will he be there for me in the future? Will he? Yes. And if you read through the Bible, people that know God, love God, wrestle with trusting God all the time. Yeah. And what's beautiful about God is he's patient with us and works with us. So read right. the life of Abraham. Did he have faith in God? Yes, it's very clear that he did in Genesis 12 and Genesis 15 states it directly. Right. But do you see him doubt God at critical moments through the rest of his journey? Sure. Yes. And you see it with every person. Right. Trust grows over time. Right. As you, well, I would say the feeling of trust grows right. as you take steps of trust. Right. Okay, God told me to do this, live this kind of life, and then he'll be there for me. I'm going to do this, but a little like, ah. Yeah, yeah. And then when I see God come through, I trust him more the next time. Sure. So is it okay to have shaky trust? Yeah. At right. that level, yeah, it's okay. Absolutely. But, uh, but it should grow over time. Right. Well, and I think a lot of people confuse, uh, like you can trust someone and still have doubts about yeah. things. The two go hand in hand. And Absolutely. as you mentioned, faith is, is trust and it's obedience. That's kind of the foundation of faith. And, but you see throughout scripture, people trusting God, but still doubting. You, you see them openly yeah. questioning, you know, God, where are you? What's happening? But nevertheless, yeah. I'll trust in your steadfast love. And they grow in their faith. Absolutely. Yeah, totally, man. Yeah. You got it. Uh, and so you also mentioned in your sermon, um, you talked about, you gave the example of addiction. You talked about how the number one leading cause of addiction is a feeling of lack of love, mm -hmm. that they are not wanted, not loved. Yeah. Um, are there any other causes? Um, we know there are other causes, but what are some other, other big causes that lead to yeah. addiction? Well, and that's where, you know, I probably blew past that too fast because mm -hmm. addiction is a complicated issue. Sure. And I certainly don't want to minimize right. addiction at all um, and minimize the complexities of it sure. either, yeah. you know? So, um, but is there a genetic disposition towards addiction uh, to certain things? I would say uh, yes, sure. you know, yeah. and um, so that would lead some people to become addicted to certain things that would not lead others. Some people right. can have a drink socially here and there and be fine. Other people find themselves looking forward to it in unhealthy ways sure. and, and abusing it. Yeah. And so 
are there genetic predispositions to addiction? Yes, there are. But what Carnes will point out that is interesting is, you know, when let's say someone is addicted to alcohol and they want to be sober, mm -hmm. there is now a physiological need for that that you've got to address first. The first order issue is let's get the alcohol out of your system right. and let's get it away from you that you're not continuing to go back to it so let's get you sober but then the deeper work is what happened that led you to begin to abuse sure. alcohol yeah. or or different you know avenues online or different substances or whatever um, usually there's some degree of pain under that yeah, and absolutely. often it can be hard to access that people are like no I do it to manage stress and you go right. well where is that stress coming from? Stress is a byproduct of, of something or sure. in your life. Right. And there's a coping strategy that you picked up because there was something difficult to deal with. Right. And so I don't know that I could sit here and say, underneath every single addiction is a love issue, but Carnes will feel comfortable saying that, I believe. I don't think I'm misquoting him. Yeah. And, um, and I do think there's something to that of having to ask that deep question of what, what pain led to going to this uh, substance. And, and again, I want to be clear, I'm not saying this in like a, a clinical and, and dismissive way. As sure. somebody who's dealt with, been around, lived through, lived with addictions of various kinds, I say it with a compassion of going, this isn't an easy issue. Sure. And I certainly don't want to suggest the sermon is, well, just feel loved by God and you'll quit being addicted or whatever. No. That's, not, that's not at all what happens. It, it becomes a journey you go through with help and supportive community, mm. but the more you begin to lean into supportive community, the less you lean on certain substances, and, and you can find a level of healing and hope that maybe you don't think is possible even now. So uh, I would encourage you, if you're struggling with a level of addiction, don't struggle in silence. Yeah. Find some people you trust, um, and maybe you look around your social sphere and go, I don't know anyone in my social sphere, so you go to a pastor or a counselor, yeah. and begin to talk about this is what I'm doing and help let them help you unearth some of the deeper issues because there is a path of freedom out and that path right. of freedom out is always loving community That's right. and and if you look at AA it always starts with acknowledging I need God right. and um, so I would say the love of God and the love of the people of God can get you out of some things that maybe now you don't see a way out of so have hope uh, because God's love is that powerful and it doesn't mean it, it's not a flip of a switch, sure. but it's yeah. there for you uh, through his community if, if, you'll, if you'll come to him, I promise. Absolutely. Thank you. That's so important. Yeah. Um, and thank That's you, Ben, question. so much uh, for being here with us this week. And thank you all for tuning in. We will see you all next week. Thanks for joining us for PostScript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.